Greetings. <clears throat> my name is Kari Bradley, and I'm the general manager of Hunger Mountain Cooperative. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our co-op's annual member meeting for 2021. It's a shame that we can't be together again in person this year, but thank you very much for being here for this combination business meeting and community celebration. We are looking forward to sharing this time with you. Sorry. Just hold. There we go. We would like to begin this meeting by acknowledging the holiday of Diwali. Diwali. Diwali is a festival of light celebrated by Hindus, Jains, Sikhs, and some Buddhists. Diwali is occurring at this time of the year, and we want to express our best wishes to every to our community members who celebrate Diwali. Thank you to Sarita and Dinesh Mamoria who helped with this acknowledgement. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Bonnie Hudspeth. Bonnie lives in Putney and is in charge of cooperative development for the neighboring Food Co-op Association. She also serves as president of the board of the Cooperative Fund of New England. Welcome Bonnie and thank you for returning to moderate our meeting again this year. Thank you so much, Kari, and hello, co-op friends. I'm glad to be back here with you all. Um, I love Hunger Mountain Co-op, and I regularly stop at the co-op en route to where my sister and my parents live in Burlington. So our family loves your cookie section, your local produce, and of course, getting to visit with your rock star staff. So we always love stopping by. And I've also had the pleasure of getting to work with and know the staff at Hunger Mountain Co-op through our neighboring food co-op association that your co-op is a part of. And so we're a network of over 40 food co-ops around the whole Northeast, working together towards this shared vision of a thriving cooperative regional economy um, and a healthy, just sustainable food system. So really have enjoyed getting to know the staff at your co-op better through this process. Um, I'm really glad to be here with you all. And we wanna make this virtual meeting as engaging as possible, starting with that awesome music. I don't know if you are all rocking out like I was <laughs> in the intro. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. So please type your comments and questions and cheers in the chat at any point. And if your chat's not currently visible, you can hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen and just click on the chat button and that will open it. Um, so if you need any tech support, send us a message in the chat. If you want to say hi to your neighbor, send them a direct message in the chat. And at any time throughout this meeting, you can share a message to everyone. You can share a message just to us, the panelists, or you can send a message to individuals. So there's lots of options for you to engage and communicate with everyone. And throughout the meeting, we're going to be sharing questions that as time allows, and we will also be, you know, if we run out of time, we're gonna be compiling all of your remaining questions and posting responses. So rest assured, all of your questions will be responded to at some point eventually. Um, and just a reminder and thanks that tonight's meeting is being broadcast on Comcast 1075 or at orcamedia.net. And a video recording um, by Orca is gonna be posted for later viewing. So if you, um, miss this or want to share it with a family member, a friend, or a neighbor, you'll be able to do that after the meeting is done. And um, also another, just one more reminder that members who pre-register for tonight's meeting are automatically enrolled in our raffle. Lucky you, right? So we're going to be announcing winners at the end, and we hope you'll stick around with us. But if you have to scoot out early for some reason, you can still win. We're going to be posting the results online, and we're going to be contacting winners. Okay, so let's dig into the plan for our evening together. We're gonna to be opening with a, a little bit more of a welcome from your co-op's leadership. And then we're gonna to get to um, vote on approval of the 2020 annual meeting minutes. We're gonna have some time celebrating co-op employees. And then we get to hear from the keynote speaker for this evening, Nicole Daney from NOFA, Vermont. 
Um, and then after Nicole shares, we're going to get, you know, you'll have time to ask questions for her and, um, and have a little interaction there. And then we're going to dive into impact reports and take your questions after that section of the reporting as, as well. And then we'll, the sort of the concluding part of the evening is really going to be hearing some highlights from the community fund grants and the big drum roll and mystery is who won the Cooperative Community Award this year? We're gonna find out and get to hear from that person. And then we'll wrap up um, with some final logistics and closing. And we're gonna be doing the raffles, of course, the highlight at the end, right? So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce your council president, Dr. Eric Jacobson, to further welcome you. Hey, Eric. Uh, you're muted. Hi, Bonnie. Thanks. Thanks very much. That was wonderful. Um, so on behalf of the Hunger Mountain Co-op and the Council, I would like to welcome all of our members and friends to the annual meeting. Normally at this time of year, we gather together and raise a toast as members for the year that has passed to celebrate the year and to acknowledge the contributions of so many individuals that have made this a, and make this a rather unique uh, member-owned cooperative, one of the most valuable and productive community assets in central Vermont. But what I'd really like to do with this opening greeting and welcome this year is to take a moment to recognize and to acknowledge in particular, the rather remarkable commitment and courage of staff who have worked through a worldwide health crisis to provide food and, and service to our community. I know I speak on behalf of the members when I express my gratitude to all of the people who contributed to the Hunger Mountain Cooperative with their labor, for their fortitude and perseverance this year, for people who served us in times of fear and shortage, for those who got vaccinated with the intention of supporting public health, for those with kids who have had to endure this year without it, for those who are struggling, who have lost loved ones, and for those who are recovering. This has been a year to remember, and I want to extend a heartfelt thanks to all our staff for their extraordinary service to the community this year. So with these words of gratitude, let us now hear from you, our members. We're going to run a couple of quick polls to get a better sense of who is with us tonight. And uh, you should see the first poll on your screen shortly. And when you see it, when it pops up, please respond by clicking. Uh, there it is. So uh, please respond by clicking on your selection. And uh, we'll wait a few minutes, uh, seconds, minutes, while the answers come in. So there you see the first poll. How many co-ops and credit unions are you a member of? Kari, are you there? How many uh, co-ops and uh, cooperatives are you and uh, credit unions are you a member of? So I'm counting four currently. I, of course, use Hunger Mountain for almost all of my groceries. I do my banking with Vermont State Employees Credit Union. We are members of Washington Electric Co-op for our electricity. And then we recently joined REI for um, all their gear. So that's great. But I also enjoy going into food co-ops around the country um, and locally. I shop um, somewhat often at Adamant, um, and sometimes Plainfield, Buffalo Mountain, and Morrisville. So lots to choose from. How about you, Eric? I think that's eight plus. <laughs> I wasn't counting. Uh, we're a member of many of those uh, cooperatives you mentioned and the credit union we bank with the uh, Vermont State Employee Credit Union. But I was thinking actually of the, the cooperative that I'm, uh, I've been part of maybe uh, that, that influenced me the most, which was a, a cooperative of um, instructors, language instructors in Berlin, Germany. So it was a cooperative organized by the teachers themselves. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at the results. Looks like the leading response is two, and that was 45%. Uh, and then one and three were next, about 20, 
interesting. Okay, great. That's terrific. Well, let's try another question now. Uh, this one's a little bit more um, substantive. Um, when you see it, uh, there it is. So here's the question. What do you think should be the co-op's highest priority goal in the coming years? Um, shall I read it out? Reduce our carbon footprint through efficiency measures, renewable energy, and buying local and organic. Improve affordability and increase community access. Three, ensure health and safety, including COVID-19 mitigation and improve working conditions. Four, enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion, or something else. So you, you do have the chat to put another item of importance uh, in the chat. And um, <clears throat> there you go, Kari, what would you think out of this? Well, uh, I'd like to hear from <laughs> you. Why don't you go first this time, Eric? <laughs> well, you know, we didn't include all of the above uh, because really all of these issues are core issues to our mission and what we do. Um, but if I really had to choose one for next year, what I think we could maybe make a breakthrough or implement some activity on would be the first to reduce our carbon footprint through um, efficiency member measures and maybe um, trying to get our energy uh, more renewable. Okay, Kari, what do you say? Yeah, I, 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 I tried, but I can't pick one. They're all extremely important and they're, and they're all part of our current business plan. And I think they're going to be part of next year's and the year after that business plan as well. There's a lot of work to do. And it just strikes me as, you know, what a privilege it is to work on these really important issues that, that matter to our co-op community. So let's see what members said. Number one response is improve affordability and increase community access. And right behind that is reduce our carbon footprint. So. There you go. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Really great. Okay, now we're going to hear from our council members. Each has prepared a brief um, recorded statement. Um, maybe there's a slide that we can see of the council. There we are. Hello, I'm Stephen Farnham. I've served on the executive committee as the council secretary for the past couple of years. In addition, I've also served on several other committees, including bylaws, communications, ethics, recruitment, and rules since first being elected to the council in 2014. It is an honor to be able to serve the co-op and the greater community in this capacity. I believe I speak for all of us on the council when I say your continued support of Hunger Mountain Co-op and of the council is greatly appreciated. I hope you find the offerings in this year's virtual annual meeting enjoyable and informative. Please don't hesitate to give us feedback after the meeting, and thank you so much for joining us. Hello, my name is Andrew Sullivan, and this is my second year serving on the Co-op Council. I am thrilled to be able to represent both my fellow employees as well as my fellow members of the Co-op. Thank you very much. Hello, Hunger Mountain Co-op members. My name is Eva Schechtman, and I'm a member of the Co-op Council. It has been my honor this year to serve as the chair of the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee and the Communications Committee. Thank you so much for this honor. Hi, I'm RJ Adler, and this is my first year on the Council. Hi, I'm Jen Poirier. I've been on your council now for about a year. I've been serving on the Carbon Neutrality Committee and we're working on some really exciting projects for you. I live locally in Montpelier, so I hope I get to see some of you around the co-op. Hi, my name is Liv Dunton and I am entering my third year on the Hunger Mountain Co-op Council. Um, I've so loved my time on the council. It has been so meaningful and so educational. Um, both in the nature of boards and how to better serve uh, our Central Vermont community and our co-op. 
Great. So we've heard from uh, some of the council members. Also serving this year were um, Deb Robinson, uh, Catherine Lothar, not featured here, and our staff rep, Rachel Andrea. So the annual meeting marks the end of the council year, and we're, we are in the process of electing new members. We have four candidates this year. You've heard from RJ, Jen, and Eva currently serving on the council. Let's hear from Lauren Antler, the only non-incumbent candidate. I'm Lauren Antler. I live in Montpelier with my daughter, my husband, our two dogs, and our cat who lives on top of the fridge. And I'm really looking forward to serving the co-op membership on the co-op council. Terrific. Um, I just want to say a, a quick message about running for council. Um, like school boards and, and, and city councils, members, um, you know, member participation and public participation is important. But for a member cooperative in which the governance and monitoring system is structured to work with a meaningful board of directors at the center of its activities, the council is really an essential feature of a cooperative. Without a strong and uh, supportive council, a co-op is not really a cooperative. It needs your support, so please consider running for a council seat. I've served for four years, and this is my final year, and it's been a very uh, stimulating experience. Uh, let me give you a brief reminder that our uh, electronic voting uh, polls will close at the end of this meeting at 7.30 tonight. We have an uncontested election this year, but voting is important for determining the final seating arrangement, so please cast your vote. We will end up with one open seat, so the council will appoint a member to fill the vacancy until next year's election. Often members are interested in these opportunities because it's a, less of a time commitment and still a chance to serve the community. You can learn more about this and view the application at the co-op's website. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us on the council if you have any questions. Applications are due uh, on the 18th of November, so you still have a little bit of time. Now I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie. Thank you so much, Eric. And now it is our time for some brief business, which is approval of the 2020 minutes. So these meeting minutes are posted on the co-op's website and hopefully you've gotten a chance to look at them, at least some of you. So I'm gonna ask now, can we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes? Um, please type in the chat so we can see you. Thank you for making the motion, RJ. How about a second? Jen Poirier, thank you so much. Oh, we got a couple seconds. It looks like Jen hopped in first. Thank you, Jen and RJ. Um, so now you'll see a poll where you can vote yes, no, or abstain. And you, if you have any comments on the minutes, you can also type them in the chat right now. So in a minute here, you're gonna see a poll pop up so that you can vote. And I see some questions about seating arrangements. There you go. So you can now vote yes, no, or abstain for around approving the Hunger Mountain Co-op's 2020 annual meeting minutes. I see some great questions and dialogue around seating arrangements and candidates and service, amount of service time on the board. Great questions. All right, we'll give you another minute here. And, and just a reminder, you know, as we're voting, let's imagine ourselves that we're sitting together, getting to smile and wave at each other, or maybe even eating tasty food from the co-op. That would be nice. That, hopefully that will be the case next year. And, and also just thank you, right? The co-op would not exist without you, the members. So thank you for participating and voting. All right. Let's see how y'all voted. Eight, 
80% voted yes to approve the minutes and 20% of you all abstained. So thank you all for participating. And I'm excited to announce the 2020 annual meeting minutes of Hunger Mountain Co-op are thus approved. So thanks everyone. Now we're warmed up and we're feeling good, right? We've gotten, we've practiced our co-op democracy in action. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Olivia Dunton, who we heard briefly from before, council member and former lead grocery buyer to celebrate the amazing co-op staff. On behalf of Hunger Mountain Co-op and the Co-op Council, we wanted to take a moment to recognize our incredible team of employees and the remarkable work they've done over the last year during these challenging times. Thank you for your dedication to your community and your co-op. The 2021 Award for Excellence in Customer Service is being given to all co-op employees. Thank you for everything you do for your co-op. We are so lucky to have such an incredible team. The council and co-op would like to give special recognition to those employees who have reached milestone anniversaries with the co-op. This includes Mary Wells, who has been with us for 30 years, Mary Trafton for 25 years, Elizabeth Jesdale for 20 years, Lana Casey for 20 years, Ellie Wood, 20 years, Michael White, 20 years, Rose Pearson, 20 years, Annika Edson, 20 years, Andrea Mills, 15 years, Jessica Rosalind, 15 years, Dana Woodruff, 15 years, Micah McIntyre, 15 years, Nessa Rabin, 10 years, Alex Dispel, 10 years, Grace Gilbert, 10 years, Taylor Dorsey, 10 years, and Kendra Mills, 10 years. Thank you so much for your service to the co-op. Wow, thank you, Olivia. And I'm struck by the amount of employees at Hunger Mountain Co-op who are celebrating a decade, 20 or even 30 years. That is some really strong commitment to the co-op and the larger community. Woo! And I see a appreciation for staff in the chat here. And, and someone, Mary Beth says, that's why I love shopping at the co-op, great staff. And Judy is clapping, thank you. Um, now, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Nicole Daney, the Certification Director for Vermont's Organic Farmers. And um, as a reminder, if you have questions for Nicole, please type them in the chat because we'll have time, some time for her at the end to respond to your questions. So Nicole, take it away. Thank you, Bonnie. My name is Nicole Daney, as Bonnie said. I'm the Certification Director for Vermont Organic Farmers. I am really thrilled to be here tonight. I'm excited to talk about the about agriculture and climate change and specifically the role that organic farmers can play in being a potential solution to our climate crisis. And of course, I'd also like to give a shout out to Hunger Mountain. When I first moved to Vermont in 1999, Hunger Mountain was by far my favorite co-op. There were a lot of reasons for this, but a big one was that Hunger Mountain was one of the co-ops um, that sold locally raised meat. And of course, there was also a killer hot bar. So just thank you, Hunger Mountain. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about our organizations. Vermont Organic Farmers, or VOF, is a USDA accredited certification body, and we're actually owned by NOFA Vermont. So what that means is VOF, we certify farms and facilities in the state to the USDA's organic regulations. And we currently certify over 800 organic farms and food producers in the state. Now, NOFA is a nonprofit organization whose mission is promoting organic practices to build a food system in Vermont that is economically viable, ecologically sound, and socially just. And for our organization, when we think about the future and what will be impacting our farmers, what will be impacting our food system, it has become abundantly clear to our board and to our staff that we can't do this food system work without addressing our current climate crisis. So I think it's important to start for, at looking at the contribution that agriculture as an industry has on climate change. 
So how do we measure this, right? Well, the EPA should be a reliable tool. And the EPA quantifies greenhouse gas emission by industry contribution. So if you look at agriculture in this light, we account for 24% of global greenhouse gas emissions. But the estimate does not include the carbon dioxide that ecosystems actually remove from the atmosphere by sequestering carbon in biomass, in dead organic matter, and in the soils, right? So this offsets 20% um, of emissions from this sector. So I, I share that to offer hope, right? Agriculture has the potential not just to net zero on our greenhouse gas emissions, but also to potentially contribute in a positive way to addressing our climate emergency. So we have a choice. How we produce our food impacts the climate. And really the next step is to look at the practices that we want to avoid. One, those practices are climate. And those practices are ones that rely on fossil fuel intensive chemical fertilizers and pesticides, practices that encourage heavy mechanization and fuel burning equipment, monocropping and reliance on chemical inputs, practices that reduce biodiversity and pollute waterways, um, and practices that encourage intensive tillage, right? Or the alternative to intensive tillage, which is conventional no-till, which replaces tillage with more toxic herbicides. So it's important to know, you know, what practices are causing issues in order for us to be able to look for solutions. And there is a solution. And that solution is organic farming practices. So using organic farming practices, we can choose to actually have a positive impact on the climate. But in order to do this, we need to educate people about what I like to call the positive definition of organic farming. So I think most people think about organic farming with, um, you know, then a negative definition, or in other words, like the absence of toxic chemicals and genetically modified organisms. And this is, of course, very crucial and important to what organic farming is all about, but it is incomplete. And if that is how most people are thinking about organic farming and defining organic farming, then we really have a failure in our messaging. And what we need to do is teach people about this positive definition of what organic farmers are trying to achieve. And what are they trying to achieve? Um, that is improving soil health, protecting natural resources, promoting biodiversity on their farms, working with natural systems instead of against natural systems, and then of course working to mitigate climate change, but also working to be resilient in the face of extreme weather events that are caused by climate change. And this isn't new. We didn't just come up with this recently to kind of join the popular club, right? This has always been what the organic movement is about. Organic has always been about regenerative and sustainable. It has always been about the opposite of extractive and industrial. And so this is really the message that we need to convey. So in 2020, VOF set out to do this. Um, and in partnership with Vital Communities and um, with help from the Vermont Agency of Ag's spe Specialty Crop Block Grant Program, we embarked on a campaign where the goal was to promote organic farmers with this positive definition in mind, right? As a solution to climate change. And from the beginning, we really understood that messaging was gonna be really important to help people understand that they can actually have a positive impact on climate change with their food purchases. And the reason that messaging matters is because climate anxiety is real. People, I mean, including myself, right? People are overwhelmed by the scientific reality of climate change, the extreme heat, the forest fires, the drought and flooding, I'm sorry if I'm sounding you know, depressing here, the loss of biodiversity, this continuous narrative of you know, impending doom. And when people feel overwhelmed in this way, you know, they don't feel inspired to take action. Instead, they feel stuck, um, they feel like there's no way that they can have an impact on this monumental problem. And like I said earlier, I'm sure we've all felt this way. But the way to counter that fear is to take action. So we need to help people understand that their choices matter and that action matters and that they can make a difference. 
And in this case, in this campaign and in the food system world, you know, food choice matters. So the message of our campaign, what we were calling our climate heroes campaign, is that supporting Vermont organic farmers can basically equate to climate action. And that in essence, we are all heroes by taking this action. So I wanted to give credit to some of the folks that really helped us create you know, beautiful images for this campaign. We worked with a bunch of talented artists. We worked with um, Cecily Anderson, um, a talented artist. We also worked with a uh, local photographer, Andy Duback, and they helped us capture images that really helped us capture this messaging of heroism. We started kind of by identifying what we wanted everyone who interacted with our ad advertisements and everyone who interacted with our educational campaign, what we wanted them to understand. And this was what we eat and how we produce our food are inseparable, right? They're inseparably linked to, to climate change. Um, that supporting organic farms and organic farming practices can help to mitigate climate change, but also that food and farms are vulnerable to climate change, right? And that organically farmed soils can actually help farmers be resilient in extreme weather events like flooding and drought. So we heard from our producers that, we, that what they needed was clear and concise talking points to address how organic practices can impact climate change. And so this is what we set out to do. And we ended up developing five major talking points for farmers to use to kind of be able to discuss this issue with their customers. And of course, the first three talking points um, are all about the soil, right? And it's about how healthy soil is key to fighting climate change. And so you can see these here on the screen. Um, we described how soils that are managed organically release fewer greenhouse gases. And the reason that this is, is because organic farmers don't use synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. And the manufacturing and the use of those fertilizers are known to create emissions of nitrous oxide, which is 300 times carbon dioxide. So as farms become certified organic, we see a reduction in those dangerous emissions. The other piece is um, that organic soils are more resilient to extreme weather. And this is because organic farmers are required to use practices that increase what's called organic matter in their soil. And this really improves the soil's ability to hold water, which in turn improves the land's resilience to again, flooding and drought. And of course that organic soils store carbon. So because organic farmers are practicing um, their practices are building healthy soils. Healthy soils are key at keeping carbon out of the atmosphere, right? So they're acting like a sponge and they're helping to reduce the impacts of climate change. And I did want to share that this picture is one of our certified organic farmers located in the Intervale, Alango Dev. He's one of the members of the cooperatively owned um, farm Diggers Mirth. I suspect that some of you might know Diggers Mirth um, for their amazing carrots and greens, which I believe that Hunger Mountain is often carrying in their produce department. So just wanted to introduce you to one of our farmers there. So another one of our talking points that was really important um, is about how organic farmers protect natural resources. So one way that organic farmers do this is by not using dangerous herbicides or toxic pesticides, right? And this helps preserve waterways, it helps preserve the environment, and of course it helps preserve our health. Another way that they protect natural resources is by actively supporting biodiversity and protecting wildlife and pollinators on their farm. So this is a picture of Dave Marchant. Some of you might know him, he's co-owner of Riverberry Farm. Um, he's a certified organic uh, farm in Fairfax. And Dave and his wife, Jane, have been farming organically for over 30 years. Um, and they're along the Lamoille River. And I'll show some pictures later on in this presentation of some of the overhead shots of their farm next to the river. But they have a great farm stand. I bet some of you also know them from uh, their wonderful um, farm stand and also their pick your own strawberries. So our last talking point is about food security. And I think all of us um, felt the importance of our local farms um, during the onset of the pandemic, right? When food supplies from outside the state were slow to arrive, 
it felt very comforting, I think, to all of us to have our CSA memberships, right? And to be able to find our local and organic produce at places like Hunger Mountain, it was critical. And of course, this the food supply issue is not over. Um, you know, we're still seeing issues in the supply chain. And frankly, we've been less affected by this issue, or we are less affected by this issue when we have product, local product available from Vermont producers. Not to mention the fact that farms are often places for community gathering, right? So whether it's you're going to pick up your CSA share or going to pick your own blueberries or even those farms that open up their land for festivals or family walks, right? I think the take home message here in this talking point is when you buy your food from a Vermont organic farm, you're investing in local food security. And that investing in the success of organic farms is also important because organic farms can contribute to vibrant and strong communities. And this picture is of Hillary Martin, who's another co-owner of the cooperative farm, Diggers Murph, down in the Intervale. So when we started this campaign, we had originally thought about messaging our farmers as the heroes, right? But our farmers, were, they, they weren't interested in that. <laughs> and they were way too modest for that. So, you know, they didn't really feel comfortable with us casting them as climate heroes, right? Which is totally understandable. But I would say in actuality, you know, they are implementing practices on their farms um, that are innovative and some people would could even say heroic. So I thought I would share, you know, some of those practices and just give you kind of a small sampling of some of the work that our farms are doing. So this picture is of Riverberry Farm again. And as you can see, see here, we took this picture in I think early June but he has got um, a beautiful swath of cover crops. Um, and Dave and Jane grow cover crops in order to protect their soil from erosion and also to build organic matter. So this picture is of Eliza and Shane Steffens of Knee Deep Farm, which is located in Jeffersonville. And you can see here, you can see them here in their greenhouse. You know, they're growing mainly tomatoes, but if you look closer, you can also see that they're intercropping with lettuces, herbs, and other greens, right? And this intercropping practice, it helps with soil erosion again. It also helps with weed management. They also get better utilization of nutrients. So when they're applying fertilizer, they're not going to waste any fertilizer. It's going to get used up by the, the plants underneath. Um, and sometimes it can even help with pest and disease management. And here's that shot I was promising you of Riverberry Farm in the spring, um, the aerial shot. You'll notice here how they make sure they have a large buffer from the river that they don't till, right? So they, you can see the area clearly that's tilled and you can see the part that's being preserved. And what this does is it promotes habitat for wildlife. And of course, it also protects the riverbank from being eroded. And this photo is a great um, aerial shot of Diggers Mirth Farm. And this really allows you on the right here to see their cover crop and also just like the diversity of crops that they're growing on their farm. This is another photo of Riverberry. And here Dave is showing how he's intercropping with his kale under the row covers with a cover crop, right? And again, the cover crops are gonna help Dave, they're gonna help him protect the soil surface from erosion. They're gonna add biomass to the soil, especially below the soil surface with the roots of the plants. And they're gonna help create a habitat for microorganisms like fungi that contribute to you know, soil biology and soil health. And my last photo here is again of Digger's Mirth. And this shot really features how the farm is growing plants that support pollinators like bees. So of course, you know, the, the pollinators and the abundance of pollinators helps farmers too, because the more pollinators they have on their farm, the better yields they're going to get for their crops. So what can we as a cooperative community do, right? We're all looking for solutions to mitigate against climate change, right? And I really believe organic farmers have an important opportunity to position themselves as a key solution to the problem. And we hear from our farmers that we certify that they really need help 
in getting out this message, right? That farmers want to help people understand about you know, the greater benefits that organic agriculture can provide, right? So that it's not just about the negative definition, about the absence of harmful chemicals, but it's about all of the positive things that farmers are trying to do and trying to achieve, right? So we need to support farmers um, in implementing practices that help improve soil health and protect natural resources. So what might this look like, right? That might mean you know, financial support for farms that are implementing these practices. And that could also be you know, farms that aren't organic, but that are using organic practices. Um, this could look like workshops and educational opportunities for farmers to learn how to implement these, these types of practices or how to better implement these types of practices on their farms. Um, and finally, we need to invest in our Vermont organic farmers as a solution to climate change. And if we really believe that organic farming practices have the power to address climate change, then we need to invest in our organic farmers so that they can do this work, right? And what might that look like? Um, that might look like an out of the box kind of creative solution, right? To make sure our farms can be successful as businesses. So making sure that they have access to business development and planning, um, looking into ways to support them, you know, through healthcare or childcare, um, or coming up with ways to make sure Vermont as a state and as a community is, you know, nurturing our local and organic farms. And my last slide is really to just say thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks for engaging in this important conversation. Thank you so much, Nicole. And what beautiful farmers photos you were able to share with us. Um, really appreciated how you brought the important role of our local farmers in feeding our communities. And that's been particularly noticeable filling in supply chain shortages during the pandemic, right? It's extra appreciation. Um, so we've got a question from Eric, um, who starts out by saying this question could be difficult to answer, but he's just looking for an estimate. If one person eats mostly organic uh, food instead of food that is not organic, how much will that affect the carbon footprint? What is the practical impact for our world moving to only organic food? Are there, are there any numbers or any way to trace this? Yeah, I wish there was a number to trace that because that would really help with kind of quantifying our action piece, right? Um, so I don't have, you know, a great, I don't have that number for you, but, um, and let's talk about like how realistic it is for, um, you know, everyone to go organic. I think when I think, when I think of the state of Vermont, you know, at the very least, I tried to show that in my presentation that yes, I'm here talking about and promoting organic farmers, but any farmer, any local farmer could also, you know, make improvements um, and implement some of these organic farming practices that will help with soil health. And honestly, we are seeing that more in the conventional community as well. So um, I, I think most of you probably, if you've been driving around Vermont, have seen cornfields that often now are, um, intercropped with cover crops so that they don't have bare soil in the winter. Like you're starting to see more of these practices that were always thought of as just organic practices that are becoming more mainstream. And in my opinion, that is a win. Great, Nicole, thank you. Um, and thank you. There was a number of other great comments and questions, cooperators. We're running a little bit short on time. I, I noticed, Nicole, there was a desire to um, to be like, hey, we want to go to the web NOFA Vermont website and see where the climate heroes are like right off the bat. So um, staff was able to find a link, but just like, could that be front and center? So it's easier for us to find as consumers. That was a great comment. Also a shout out to Migrant Justice, Milk with Dignity program. And um, also just a reminder to folks that um, if you are interested in a question, instead of raising your hands, just put it in the chat. Um, and there's a number of other good questions. Maybe we'll circulate them to you, Nicole, because we're, we're needing to transition now. And I just wanna thank you so much for sharing. And it's really inspiring to hear the work that you and Nova Vermont are doing in partnership with local farmers to make our, our food system more resilient. So thank you so much. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank, thank you, Hunger Mountain, for having me. And my email is on the website so people can um, 
feel free to email me as well. Excellent. Yeah, we'll make sure to post it in the chat. Thanks, everyone. Um, and thank you for sharing, Nicole. And I will now turn it back over to Eric and Kari for this year's impact reports. Thanks very much, Bonnie. And thanks, Nicole, for your inspiring presentation. It ties into what I'm going to discuss now. <clears throat> the council likes to think uh, in terms of impact, uh, the positive impacts that we can have in the community as the result of the work that we do. Supporting our organic and local food system is a key piece of that impact. In fiscal year 2021, the co-op sold $12.9 million in organic products and 9.4 million in local products. There is no question that we play an important role in the system that provides high quality and environmentally sustainable food in central Vermont. At the same time, we uh, purchased last year $8 million in goods and services from 390 Vermont vendors. This speaks to the strength of the local food system that we have helped to create here in Vermont. But there are certainly challenges. Um, we all know the importance of shopping locally, and we all saw how those uh, little arrowed cardboard boxes that appeared in our mailbox made one person in particular the richest man in the United States. We know that the large commercial supermarkets in Vermont are owned by multi-billion dollar international corporations with annual revenues in the billions. Now is a difficult time for all small businesses. The co-op, for example, has lost four bakery vendors in the last year. We have rising expenses, labor shortages, and supply disruptions, disruptions, which is increasingly difficult for our local producers. As inflation is said to continue to rise over 5%, our co-op community needs to do more to um, support them. Now a slide about our member owners. We have a strong standing in Central Vermont as one of the largest membership-based organizations. The following slide shows how our membership has grown over the past five years, reaching 10,464 at the end of June, which is really a remarkable number when you think about the fact that there are 58,000 people in Washington County and uh, maximum 8,000 in the city of Montpelier. We could probably do a lot more as a member buying organization. What other necessary goods and services could we provide and own collectively? Each year, the co-op conducts a member shopper survey, and this year you express an, ex an especially high level of satisfaction with the co-op. When asked how likely you were to recommend the co-op to friends and colleagues, the average rating was 4.7 out of 5. Next, I want to highlight some of the ways the co-op is working to support the broader community. Um, next slide, please. There it is. In 2020, we had given out just under $40,000. This year in 2021, our total donations and sponsorships came to just over $77,000. We can be proud of the fact that the co-op doubled the amount that was given back. These funds came both from co-op operations and donations from you, donations from the members that were made through rounding up at the cash registers. About half of these funds went to food pantries and the Vermont Food Bank, so thank you to 10,000 10, strong co-op members for helping to address food insecurity in central Vermont. I also want to tell you about the 10% discount that the, the co-op provides members with limited income. The program is called Co-op Cares, and over the course of the year, we extended it to nearly, uh, um, we, we extended nearly $50,000 in co-op care discounts, which is a 27% increase over the prior year. This reflects a growing need in the community and our efforts to promote the program and make the co-op more accessible to more people. Before I end, I just want to mention some of the work that the Council has been focused on this year. 
The Communications Committee has been working on a cooperative community conversations proposal. Staff are working towards re-establishing a paper and online comments and questions section and getting a letters to the editor function up and running and creating an online message board in 2022. The Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee has been working to establish language in the ENDS policies and setting up a framework for ongoing diversity, equity and inclusion education for council members in the coming year. The council has been helping staff with solutions to reduce our carbon emission as a co-op. We have a goal to eventually become carbon neutral in our operations by reducing our energy consumption and utilizing more renewable energy. The committee is also looking at ways we can all play a role in reducing the environmental impacts in our food system. And our bylaw committee has been developing proposed revisions to the bylaws. A special meeting of the members to consider the proposal had to be postponed for health and safety reasons, but the committee hopes to bring forward the proposal in a special meeting in 2022. And now back to Kari for a financial report. Thanks, Eric. I'm going to discuss how our co-op performed in fiscal year 2021, which ended June 27th. If you'd like uh, more information about any of tonight's presentation, these slides are now posted on the co-op's website. Our annual impact report will be available shortly, and you can reach out to any of us on staff or council with any questions, uh, or try emailing annualmeeting at hungermountain.coop. So when we began the year last July, we were not at all sure how the pandemic would affect our community or our business. Sales for the year were essentially equal to the year prior, uh, with net sales coming in at just under $25.4 million. For most of the year, we saw significant decreases in the sales of prepared foods and to some extent our wellness products. But these were offset by the increases in grocery and produce sales as more customers were eating at home more often. And this was very similar to what was seen at other co-ops and grocery stores around the country. The pie chart here shows how, where the money goes. So the majority of our revenue goes to paying for the cost of goods, the products that we sell. Second to that, employee compensation is most significant. Wages, benefits, and associated expenses accounted for about 29% of sales last year. Our compensation was up somewhat from the year prior. Although we saw reduced staffing levels, we did increase hourly pay, paid time off, employee discounts, and more in recognition of the challenges of working through the pandemic. All the other expense categories totaled about 5% of sales and were below budget. So I'm pleased to report that net operating income came to $341,211, just about 1.3% of sales. It was a solid year under normal circumstances and very good under the actual circumstances. But what made it truly unique financially was uh, the federal COVID relief funding. First, we had a Paycheck Protection Act loan that we received last summer and that was forgiven. Then we learned that we qualified for the employee retention credit, which is being provided to businesses that kept their people employed despite significant operating restrictions imposed by the government such as the closing of our food bar and cafe. Between these two sources, we recognized over $3.3 million in additional income. On Monday this week, the council voted to declare a patronage refund of $1.9 million and $384,700 of that is going to be distributed back to members with the balance staying with the co-op. This will be the largest amount that we have ever returned to members and your portion will be equal to approximately 1.9% of your purchases last year. And again, this year we, you will receive the refund in the form of a credit at the registers. When we factor all this in, the co-op finds itself in a relatively strong financial position. Our liquidity is measured by our current ratio and our solvency shown here as the ratio of liabilities to equity were both very favorable at the year end. And this means that we are well positioned to meet both our short-term and our long-term financial obligations. 
I would like to note that the federal funds that I mentioned were one-time sources, so really they should be matched with one-time uses. And in that spirit, we re recently elected to repay early our bank loan from our 2008 expansion. And now we can consider some other investments to further our mission. This is all very good news, uh, but I do want to highlight that the co-op is facing a variety of significant challenges. Eric mentioned a few of those. Like other businesses, we've experienced a shortage of employees um, for much of the past year, fairly severe at times, with some de departments impacted more than others. And at the same time, many of our employees are tired. They're worn out from the long and stressful experience of this past year, past year and a half. Currently, we're facing shortages in supply, both from national and local suppliers. These are related to labor market to the labor market and disruptions at almost every link in the supply chain. It's not clear how long these will take to resolve and we should expect some price inflation over the uh, coming months as a result. But given our resilience over the past 18 months, I'm confident that we can respond to these challenges and the next ones that come along. Um, and of course, we do have to keep in mind that we are still operating uh, during a pandemic. Health and safety have been a, um, our top priority throughout and that will continue. So on that note, uh, let me say a few words about shopping during our upcoming holidays, which is always the busiest time of the year. We will continue to require masking inside the co-op while local cases or uh, numbers are high. Uh, we encourage distancing, but do not plan to return to metering of customers in order to limit the numbers uh, in the store at any one time. We will continue to offer curbside pickup seven days a week. And I encourage you to go to our website and give it a try if you haven't yet. For anyone who's looking to avoid the busiest shopping at times, generally speaking, early before 11 a.m. and late after 6 p.m. are slower, along with Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays. And I say that in general. We have adjusted our hours of operation to 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., and this will last through the end of January. This gives us a chance to stock up, clean up, and get out of your way each morning. Also during November and December, we are only offering special orders on beer, wine, and meat. And this is in response to the supply shortages and to free up some of our staff time. And the deadline for ordering a Thanksgiving turkey is coming up quickly on, on November 15th. And a heads up that we will be closed on Thanksgiving and the day following, the 25th and 26th. And, and that's in order to give our staff a well-deserved break. I wanna take a moment to thank everyone, our customers, our members, our local vendors, council members, and especially our employees for your dedication and support over the past year. And finally, I wanna highlight that from now through the end of December, the co-op is organizing our Neighbors Helping Neighbors Food and Fund Drive with all donations going to the Vermont Food Bank and our local food pantries. We launched this drive for the first time last year and we had a, a lot of success. Now we wanna do even more, more to address the food insecurity in Central Vermont. You can help by donating any amount at the cash register. We have secured matching donations from our community partners, Northfield Savings Bank, Cabot Creamery and Feral Distributing. Uh, food donations are also being collected at the co-op every day. Our goals are $20,000 and 500 pounds of food. It's ambitious, and I urge everyone to participate in this important community event. So with that, Bonnie, I'm going to turn it back to you to moderate our questions and comments. Sure, Kari. Thank you. Um, I love that ambitious goal, and I totally believe in the co-op community and being able to pull together based on everything I've seen so far. So um, great. So there were some great comments. and. In, and I saw a number of comments and we also have some previously submitted questions and the co-op staff have been doing a great job recording the questions and making sure they're gonna be directed to the appropriate either staff or board. Um, and a number of them are suggestions about packaging, et cetera. So that will be, follow, we'll follow, make sure to follow up with that. Um, a question that was submitted for you, Kari, before was, how, how, what else can we do to support co-op staff during this difficult time? Yep, good question. Uh, as I mentioned, um, stress levels are fairly high. It's a difficult time to operate a grocery store and it has been that way for quite a, quite a while. 
I think the main thing that I would say is to just please be patient, please be um, kind. Um, it's it's um, really important that we all just treat each other really well at this time. And if it takes a little longer, if you're missing your favorite product um, in a certain moment, um, just know that we really want to help. And uh, sometimes it's hard to hear with the masks and um, sometimes there's tension and frustrations running high, but I really just encourage people to be patient and, and be kind, try to be empathetic. And um, I think that's the main thing. Thanks, Kari. And I saw Stephen weighed in and said, wear your mask, <laughs> which is helpful. Yes. Um, and then uh, there was a, another question, uh, and I'll point this one to you, Eric, from about how can members get informed about the council's work? or if they're interested, how do they help? Um, members can contact any, uh, any, any member of the council to find out more about how the council runs. I mean, I really encourage members to consider um, running for council, getting a more dynamic uh, um, election process going. Uh, you can always contact, if you wanna find out more about the council process, you can also contact uh, info uh, and it will be directed to either council member or to staff to answer your question. Um, well, another thing, Eric, I'd, I'd mention is that uh, council meets generally the first Monday yeah. of each month at 530 and uh, members are, are invited to join us and we have um, open comment session okay. sections at the beginning and the end of the meeting. Correct. So members really can participate in, in both in the beginning and the end of the meeting and get their, uh, have their voices heard. Thank you, Eric and Kari. And I'm seeing some great chat and I love to see members co-creating value, thinking about how they can use their cooperative to, to meet unmet needs in the community, including kind of getting at the root of food insecurity, right? That co-op cares is, the co-op is stepping up and allocating resources to making sure more of our community can be fed and also what can the co-op do to address the root of the problem right that's a really valuable comment on how you know what as co-op board staff and members can we do to address food insecurity and hunger in our community is a really great point um and then also some good questions about and, and some comments about what can we do to reduce waste or can we encourage refillable mugs discount for refillable mugs. Um, anyone want to weigh in on that around sustainability efforts, Kari? Reusables? Yeah, um, we do encourage the reuse of uh, mugs and um, we do have a discount. I have to make sure it's activated. We we stopped encouraging re reusable mugs early on in the pandemic. Um, uh, but now that we have our food bar open and, and, um, and really the concern is around airborne transmission, um, there's no problem with reusable mugs and, and yeah, look for more information on us encouraging reuse because I think that's an important way to reduce uh, waste for sure. Great. Thank you so much. And I'm seeing a couple comments here around from Judy, every, just around the concern and keeping each other safe. So appreciate that reminder. And I, and I can see the care that y'all, I wish we could see your faces that you're, you're contributing to this and thinking about how the co-op can play a role in keeping our community safe and being cutting edge with our sustainability, supporting farmers, reducing waste. So it's really, really apparent um, the, the concern and care that you all are sharing and really appreciate that. Um, all right, I think we're gonna wrap up for now. If you have more questions, please do submit them in the chat and we're gonna make sure to, um, to follow up so that we can address the, your questions. So we also wanna to remember to invite you to join us for the Monday, November 8th at 5.30 for further discussion. And we'll be, Kari will share info at the end of the meeting so you can put it on your calendar if you're interested. And then also a reminder, submit additional questions. If you think of it tomorrow or in the middle of the night, uh, annual meeting at hungermountain.coop. We'll post that in the chat as well. And, and as, as we've sir, said before, the staff is going to be compiling all your questions and responses in upcoming newsletters. So we'll get to see comprehensive responses to that. 
All right, thank you for the impact reports and for your awesome questions and comments, members. And now I'd like to introduce Claire Wheeler, who is the chair of the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Fund Committee to announce this year's grant recipients. Hey everybody, my name is Claire Wheeler and I'm currently the chair of the Hunger Mountain Co-op Community Fund. I'm really pleased to be here to share with you an update on the work we did this year. So the Hunger Mountain Co-op Community Fund was founded in 2005 to offer financial support to organizations, businesses, and initiatives that are aligned with our co-op's mission. So over the past 15 years, I'm proud to say that we've given out nearly $60,000 in grants to over 50 participants. The Community Fund Advisory Committee is uh, made up of member owners like me, council members, as well as co-op staff. Our committee makes grant recommendations to the council who has final approval. And our criteria include alignment with the Hunger Mountain Co-op mission, anticipated project impact, and the applicant's access to other resources. We gave particular attention this year to uh, groups disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And we also gave special consideration to currently and historically marginalized groups. The fund is supported by donations from members and the co-ops operation. So thank you to those of you who made a donation to the fund. This year also the council elected to donate uncashed patronage refund refunds to the fund. So thank you to the council. With those funds, the co-op is able to support projects that we know are making a real difference in our community. And we were gratified to receive 12 applications this year. We are very happy to announce that we were able to award $11,500 in grants to 10 deserving local organizations and businesses. So here's a, and here's an overview of the groups that receive funding. The Montpelier Parks and Trees Department got funding to build a wash pack station for the Feast Farm. Cabot Community Action received funding for the Cabot Harvest Hub, which is an online winter farmer's market for local producers. Rural Vermont received funding to host two workshop series that will provide farmers and consumers with more options for buying, selling, and processing their own food. Capstone Community Action received funding to put up some shelving for their online food ordering system. And Good Samaritan Haven received funding for their project to purchase and renovate a motel complex in order to provide emergency shelter beds and services for our homeless folks in the area as part of a matching funds campaign. Downstreet Housing and Community Development to support their project to create sober living housing for women and their dependent children. Earthbeat Seeds, which is a co-op vendor for seed packing equipment. The Children's Early Learning Space to support them to purchase land and building in order to expand local childcare opportunities, including outdoor spaces. The Mad River Path to fabricate and install a kiosk to inform people about the public land, the path and the apple orchard on the path and the Orchard Valley Waldorf School to build a kitchen to process food grown in the garden. So congratulations to our grantees and thank you all for supporting our community cooperative fund. Take care. Wow, y'all, over $11,000 this year to local organizations who are transforming the region in a lot of different ways that we've just heard. So. Way to go co-op community, that's you. And I'm seeing a lot of love in the, in the chat too and appreciation from some folks representing some of these organizations. So big shout out and cheers to how the community is showing up and the co-op is channeling resources toward back into the community for these amazing projects. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Stephen Farnham from Council to share the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Fund Award. Greetings. Each year, the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Award is presented to a co-op member, customer, vendor, employee, or other stakeholder in recognition for special contributions the recipient has made to our cooperative community consistent with the Hunger Mountain Co-op's mission to create and sustain a vibrant community of healthy individuals, sustainable local food systems, and thriving cooperative commerce. The Co-op Council solicits nominations for the Community Award and then selects a winner in the fall. Our winner will receive a beautiful glass apple locally crafted by Matt Seasholz 
along with gift certificates from the co-op. This year, the award goes to Peter Coleman of AR Market and Vermont Salumi. Pete Coleman grew up in East Montpelier on Kate Farm, pioneers of Vermont's organic movement and a longtime supplier of tomatoes, seedlings, and other produce to the co-op. As a youngster helping out on the farm and at the co-op, Pete learned the importance of sustainable farming techniques for supporting healthy people, animals, and communities. During many visits to Italy while reconnecting with its roots, Pete apprenticed with the Norsini, famed butchers of Umbria, who taught him the methods, techniques, and centuries-old traditions of salumi making. Pete returned home and founded Vermont Salumi, a purveyor of authentic, all-natural cured and fresh pork sausages. It is part of Vermont Salumi's mission to make products from simple ingredients with careful craftsmanship. Their process starts with antibiotic-free pork because they believe it's healthier and better for the environment. Vermont Salumi has grown to be one of the state's finest and most recognizable local food brands. Never content to rest on past successes, Pete opened AR Market, an independent, full-service grocery in the heart of downtown Barry. As a local food producer, retailer, and consumer, Pete is truly a great asset for the local food community. Congratulations, Pete, and thank you. Hi, everyone at the uh, national meeting. It's Pete from Vermont Salumi reporting to you from our new dry care facility at 159 North Main Street in downtown Barrie. We moved our dry care portion of our facility here as well. We built a grocery store up front. You can't see it because we're on the roof. This little pipe here is actually attached to our aging rooms and the smell of capicolo and salami is wafting up as I speak. About two weeks ago, Kari emailed me and said, Pete, got five minutes for a phone call? And I thought to myself, oh God, he's letting me know that they're gonna open a grocery store in downtown Barrie. And I've spent the last year trying to gain some traction with the grocery store in downtown Barrie, and they're gonna put me out of business. But lo and behold, I was wrong. He called with another exciting piece of information. Kari was calling to tell me that I was awarded this com community award, which I was not familiar with, um, but I'm very appreciative and thankful, and I don't really know why I'm getting it, but um, I don't ever feel like I'm quite a huge steward of the community, um, but I'm impressed and honored to feel like there's enough people out there who do things that think that. I grew up in, in Montpelier, had a job at Hunger Mountain when I was 17 or 15, I don't remember when it was. Stocking shelves, had my paper route in downtown Montpelier, and moved out to East Montpelier where my folks owned the Cape Farm, and you know, kind of lived the lifestyle without even knowing it or trying it. They were so ingrained in you know Saturday Farmers Market back when it was teeny, um, Hunger Mountain Co-op back when it was teeny. They were, you know, they were all a, a pretty intrinsic part of the evolution of our food system here in central Vermont um, and I think I was I guess I was part of it without even really knowing it or being conscious of it and I feel pretty lucky about that but um, afterwards I ended up building upon that and starting Vermont Salumi I guess yeah which is you know a sausage salami meat company here now in downtown Barrie um, which has been incredibly exciting um, Hunger Mountain Co-op has been a, a big role in, in growing and fostering this business. Now the co-op is um, paramount in shaping some of these small food businesses around here. They, you know, you take the time to work with us as infants to help us grow. And I guess at the end of the day, you know, I look, you know, this is in Montpelier, we're over here in Barrie, there's a little bit more vacancies, but same problem, you know. We all have these downtowns that we really need to work on. And here's, you know, 9,000 square feet here. We've got another 9,000 square feet there. Dealt with this one. It's been empty for 10 years. And, and really, I think the co-op and all those folks shopping there can feel proud that, you know, it didn't happen overnight, but you just keep putting down your money for the right customers, for the right companies. 
and they're going to take over these spaces and they're going to try their best to fill them up and they're going to try and build these these little lifebloods in our community that just give us all a little bit more reason to wake up and shop downtown and feel like we are connected to something a little bit larger than just our our little insular family unit so with that being said I want to thank everyone for I guess choosing me to as the recipient of this award I'm still humbled and I think the the thing that I take away from the last two years is really if you just keep plugging away a little bit every day don't don't go big just a little bit every day you know all of our actions do accumulate and they do turn into these pivotal moments in the way our landscape around us is formed. So keep up the good work. I'll keep doing my part. Keep doing yours. Thank you so much. And next year, we'll be meeting in person. Ciao. So congratulations to Pete on all your contributions to the co-op community. He clearly is a humble guy. <laughs> Um, and he did a great job, you know, connecting the dots between the role that the co-op plays as an incubator for small businesses and small farmers and producers like him and how, you know, so really three cheers for you all as the member owners who are the heart of this co-op for purchasing from Pete and other producers and that they are then able to grow their businesses to 9,000 square foot operations in neighboring communities and then grow them and then reinvest back in their communities. So thank you for being part of that beautiful cycle. And I'm seeing a lot of love and appreciation for Peter and enjoying the sound of Canada geese <laughs> in the background and the appreciation for the rooftop view of Barry. So really, exciting to see that how that connects back to the co-op's mission and vision and how really exciting it is to recognize Pete for his role. Um, great. Well, Kari, I'll turn it back over to you one last time to wrap things up and close our evening together. So thank you all for having me again. It's been a pleasure. I love seeing your participation and, and um, go co-op. Thanks, Bonnie, and congratulations to Pete. I just wanted to mention that for the past couple of years, our prepared foods department has been proactively seeking local meats for our sandwiches. And so when we reached out to Pete, he um, took that seriously and he developed the local ham for us. And if you haven't tried it, it's a fantastic product. It's tasty, it's unique. And um, not only has it become so popular that he's now selling it in other grocery stores, but Pete's ham has helped us to uh, work with other local producers for our sliced meats. And this fills an important gap in our local food profile. So I really think that that's a, a great story. It's the kind of innovation that really helps us to build a resilient local food system. So thanks, Pete. So let's move into our closing section now. And I wanna start by uh, recognizing our outgoing council members. First, uh, Rachel Andreev, who has been our staff representative for this past year. Rachel, thank you so much for your service. And Deb Robinson, who is our treasurer. Deb, it's been a pleasure working with you. And then last but not least, uh, Eric, who served on the council for four years total and this last one as president. Uh, certainly it was one of the most challenging years that the co-op has ever faced. And thank you so much, Eric, for your thoughtful leadership. And uh, we have gifts for each of you and much appreciation for your hard work and dedication. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the council is planning to appoint a member to serve until the next year's election. The application to be appointed is available um, at our website and it's due November 18th. Uh, at that point, the council will interview applicants and then um, plan to select someone in early December. So I hope you'll consider applying and let us know if you have any questions. And also, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we will be having one more member roundtable discussion. It's this coming Monday at 5.30 p.m. And this will be an opportunity to further discuss the topics that we covered here tonight or any others that you would like. 
Um, so join us via Zoom and you can find the login at um, uh, on our website. And you can also email us at annualmeeting at hungermountain.coop. We will respond to all the questions and comments and we really appreciate hearing your input and we appreciate you being here tonight. So thank you very much and back to you, Eric. Thank you, Kari, Kari, and thank you for that uh, very kind comments. All that is left to do now is just to thank our, our um, donors and participators, um, artists uh, Matt C. Schultz and Pizzazz Pottery for their work. We receive ongoing support from Northfield Savings Bank, from Feral Distributing, and the Cabot cooperative and thank you orca media for broadcasting and recording tonight's uh, meeting many thanks to bonnie for moderating our meeting it was she did a wonderful job and um, we also need to thank the employees who put many hours in planning and preparing this event uh, stephanie Kanonen, rowan sherwood jess knopp robin pierce and kyle's boulet thank you all for your support and we would love your feedback on how this meeting went. A survey will be emailed to all participants shortly. And last but not least, on to our raffles. Drum roll, please. The slide lists our first group of winners. Congratulations, winners. We will be contacting you about how you can pick up your prizes. And our grand prize goes to here it is the first mega food basket raffle number one to colin kutin congratulations mega food basket raffle number two to david lahar congratulations and the hundred dollar hunger mountain co-op gift card to wit doll congratulations to all the grand prize winners um Thank you for joining us to everyone, all of our members, and I uh, hope you have a, a safe and um, a happy holiday season. So with that, let us adjourn by consensus at 7.22 p.m. by unanimous consent. And uh, we'll leave up the Zoom so that you may leave comments and questions. So thank you very much to everyone again, and uh, good night.